Good morning. Welcome to online worship at United Church of Sandwich. I am Pastor Tom Burke, and I am thankful and blessed that you are able to worship with us today. We are all worshiping online. Our church has suspended in-person worship for this weekend, November 1st, and the weekend of November 8th. Due to the rising infection rate and new restrictions placed in our region, we had made the decision to suspend in-person worship for a couple weeks to keep everyone safe, healthy, and well. The plan is to return to inside in-person worship on the weekend of November 7th and 8th, but that will de uh, be determined by the situation on the ground and in our community as we approach that weekend. We will keep everyone informed on our decisions as we take this one step at a time. When we do return to in-person worship, there will be restrictions on how many people can worship at a given time, and we are going to have two worship services for the rest of 2020. We will have a Saturday night 5 p.m. worship service and a Sunday morning 10 a.m. worship service all information about how we are returning to inside in-person worship can be found on the front page of our website, unitedchurchsandwich.org. And we invite you to head there to check that out and learn more about our church. Today is All Saints Sunday in the world. And we lift up prayers for those who have passed away and are with our Lord and Savior. We have decided to postpone our specific celebration and honoring service of the saints who have gone home until we can be in person. And we will resume our official All Saints Sunday celebration in a few weeks as we are able to come back in person and more details are to follow. Thank you for worshiping with us. And if you have any questions, please contact us by email or phone through our contact information on our website. God bless and have a wonderful worship. It only takes a spark to get the fire going. And soon all those around can warm up in its glow. Please join me in the opening dialogue. Each one of us here is different. We are unique individuals. We come from various backgrounds. We come with differing needs and dreams. Yet the Lord calls us to worship in unity. Praise be to God who blesses our diversity and our unity. Amen. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, we are a people who strive with one another, but we remember. We remember Joseph, whose brothers threw him away, but he forgave them and became their salvation. We remember Jacob and Esau, who fought in their mother's womb, but they became reconciled on the battlefield. We remember your people, who suffered in exile, and Queen Esther, who took a stand for such a time as this to end the strife. And still we strive against one another. Our brothers strive against sisters. Mothers and fathers strive against daughters and sons. We strive among races, among nations, among classes. We strive across the miles and across the ages. We strive in the Christian family, in the human family. But Jesus prayed for our unity. Almighty God, you reconciled us to yourself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You created one humanity out of the two. You have broken down the dividing wall of hostility. You say there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. You say how good it is for us to dwell in unity. You say there's plenty good room. You say get on board, there's room for many more. You say lay down your sword and shield down by the riverside and study war no more. Amen. The scripture lesson is John 17 verses 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. One, two, three, four. All creatures of our God and King up your voice and with us sing Alleluia, Alleluia Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer gleam Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him Rushing wind that art so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise Him, hallelujah. Now, rising morning, praise, rejoice. Ye lights of evening, find a voice. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him.
Have you ever heard of a show called Shark Tank? It's a popular show on TV where there's a group of sharks, investors, people who've received, uh, uh, obtained success in their life and in business, and entrepreneurs can go forward, present their idea, and hopefully make a deal with one of the sharks to grow and expand their business idea. We enjoy it because it's a show we can watch with the kids. Uh, it's interesting to see how business works and see all these cool and interesting ideas. Some are terrible, some are fantastic. One, I was torn about whether I loved it or not. And it was a mom who created this kind of like a foldable hamper, but is a foldable divider, three sides, the back and two sides. And what she would do is, with her three young kids in the back seat, this divider would go right behind the back of the middle child with two walls on each side. And she created it because especially on long car trips, the kids bickering and arguing with each other throughout that ride made it that much more torturous for the parents. And so the divider up, all three kids had their own space. And I thought, I would love that. I remember being a uh, child in the car with two sisters and how we would bicker and fight in the back seat. I remember being a parent with three kids in the back, bickering and arguing. And so I thought, what a great idea. But then I also thought, with the divider up, each kid can annoy and bother the other kid without them seeing it coming. Just poking the side, bothering. And I thought, as great as those dividers are, would they really stop the kids from annoying each other and pushing each other's buttons? Probably not. Kids will find a way to bicker and argue. Especially brothers and sisters. And that's kind of the idea of what we're dealing with today, because today we're talking about unity and community, and we've looked at this passage in John. And uh, some parables, some passages of Jesus, you read them and they just hit you immediately. You understand what he's talking about. When you look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son, when Jesus proclaims that for God so world, loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not die but have everlasting life, they are very clear and concise. And sometimes, like the Good Samaritan, there's deeper undertones that you can really grow and learn about. But on the surface, it's a clear message. This passage is a little bit more complicated. Because what Jesus is saying is not always what we are hearing. We come with our bias and our expectations, and we hear what we want to hear. What is he saying in this John passage? What does he want us to hear beyond our own biases? In John 17... They're at the final days of his life. This is the Passion Week. In one chapter, Jesus will be arrested and proceed towards that cross to die for us. And these are his final teachings and thoughts as presented in John. And he speaks on unity. Let me read again what he says. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the disciples that he was praying for in the previous passage in John 17. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be the one, they may be one as we are one. I in them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know what, that you have sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. 
One of the struggles that we have in this concept of unity is that we envision this idea of heaven on earth, this, this utopia, that there is no dissension, there is no conflict, there is no war, there is no strife, that in this united community, there is just love and agreement. And you can take this in the church or in the community or in the nation or in the world. But the idea that for some, unity has one complete set of beliefs. That there is one undivided church. That everybody who is a part of it is in full agreement on everything in every way. This is not possible. This is a fantasy that we, uh, we hope to achieve, that we think we can, that we think God wants us to achieve, but this is not what's going to happen. And I'm not, I, this is not what Jesus is praying when he's praying for unity of those disciples to go out and spread the love of Christ and to be united in doing so. There was a theologian in the 20th century. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He, uh, he actually was, was executed by, by the Nazis. He was German, and he was part of a resistance to fight against the hatred, evil, and actions of Hitler and the Nazis. He believed that it was more wrong to stand by and do nothing to take a stand and act against evil. In his book, Life Together, he talks about the church, he talks about the Christian community, the, the, the believers of, of Jesus Christ. And he describes this idea of unity in this fancy way as a wish dream. That the harmony we envision is not likely and it's probably not even possible. He goes on to say that you and I have no right, we have no reason to be disillusioned when it doesn't meet our expectations. That when we desire perfect agreement and then we are disappointed and we are let down when that does not happen, especially in the church, that we have no right to be angry or upset about it. For it is somehow in our very experience of this community that in not meeting our hopes and dreams that we actually discover what life in the church should be about. Not because we disagree or agree, agree with each other, each other, but because that the ways in which we struggle and the ways in which we try to understand and connect with each other enables us to clearly see what Christ has done for us. That's the glory of the faith. Because even in our differences, even in our brokenness, when we come together and we see the struggles, we see the power of Christ's love. When we see the differences, we see the power of forgiveness. That in the church, we see our faults and we can examine them and we see the need for God and how true it is. We see our struggles and we see the struggles of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are unified, not because we all agree or we are all the same, but because we all need God. And we all need the love of Christ. We aren't perfect. We are always cohesive. We bicker. We argue. We struggle. But that's what family is brought together in our imperfection because God's love for us and God's love for each other through us is greater than our differences. That's what family is. I've never encountered in all of my ministry and in all of my life that idealized, leave-it-to-beaver family. 
where everyone gets along, where the parents always know best, the kids always behave, no one argues or fights, no one's feelings are hurts, no one is betrayed, no one is uh, knocked down. It doesn't exist. The family I grew up in was not perfect. We each had our own flaw, uh, flaws and our own faults, and we, we would bother each other, and we would disappoint each other from time to time. The family I have right now with my wife and children is far from perfect. And we disagree and we bicker and we don't get along sometimes. And sometimes with the kids as parents, we decide it's better on that day and that afternoon for them to be in different rooms. Because them separated is more peaceful than them together. We do that. Families argue. We disappoint. We say and we do hurtful things. Sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes it is intentional. But we love each other. And even in our dysfunction, we depend on each other. And we need each other. And we gather together when the storm's coming. And we hold each other. That's what the church family is all about. We all love the same Christ. And more importantly, we are all loved by the same Christ. We all have one faith. We've all been baptized. And if you have not had an opportunity to be baptized, I invite you to accept that the Christ who loves me loves you for who you are. And that when you are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are loved fully and completely by the same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who loves me. And so even if we bicker and argue, and even though if we don't agree on everything in the church, we still love each other and we forgive each other. We're still there for each other. There's a Christian statement I love that says, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Which said, there are a few things as Christians that we agree on. We agree on Christ's love. We agree on that God loves us, that he sent his son to us, and that there is nothing we can do to earn our freedom our life, our forgiveness, but there is nothing we have to do. It is freely given by God. That God loves us no matter who we are, where we are, what we've done. We agree on that together. But anything else, we say, liberty. Let us accept each other's differences. Partly, I'm talking about unity and community today because in a few days, we will have an election. And we will elect a president in the United States. And we will elect senators and congressmen and officials nationally, state, and local to lead us. And any time we are dealing with politics, we're dealing with differences. Some of us are Republicans, some of us Democrats, and some of us are none of the above. Some conservative, some liberal. Some have economic policy beliefs that head one way, and some have them that head another way. Social issues that head in different direction. Our understanding of how we feel about how this country should be run. What laws should exist and what laws shouldn't. Do we reject everyone who has different beliefs than us? Should we reject those people in our lives that have different political opinions than us? How do we apply John 17 to our current situation? 
we accept we are family. And unity does not mean we agree on the same issues. It means that our love for each other goes beyond our disagreement. Unity means we are family, and family means that we pray for each other when there's a need. It means we bake cookies or make a meal, provide food when a loved one, a brother or sister in Christ is going through a hard time. It means we grab our hammer and our screwdriver to work together on a project that's in need. It means we speak up and join others when they're hurting. It means that our differences do not stop us from showing that person who sits next to us on Sunday morning, lives next to us in our lives, works next to us from Monday through Friday, shops in the same store as we do, goes to our, the same parks, sends the, their kids to the same school we do, that we love them no matter what. Now, to be family means that you can have different opinions, but it also means that we must understand where the other person is coming from. In the church, I'll give you a clear example. A person may find their way into the church as a young child from a non-religious family. And their family might not be healthy. And so when they come to church and they hear about a father, a Lord, a God that loves them, that cares for them, that is strong for them, they find they are a child of God and they embrace that. And as they grow into adulthood, that becomes a defining understanding of who they are. They are a child of the father. We celebrate that. That is how they understand God. But another person may be in church and they may have had a life growing up where their father was abusive. And so the very notion of father, the very term hurts them. And so they struggle to connect with God at all in the understanding of God the father. And that's okay because God is so much more than a father. God connects to us in a thousand different ways. And they need to embrace God in a way that is not the father. Who's right and who's wrong? They are both right. And if they accept the way the other person sees the father and works to value that way, then they are loving the other person as a family, even in their differences. In the political world, we have different economic opinions. We have different social justice opinions and different opinions about the way the world should operate. And it's okay to have differences, but what we need to do is look at a someone who disagrees with their opinions and say, where are they coming from? What are their needs? What are their concerns? And how can I value them instead of seeing them as an enemy? And when we do that, we make them family. And then our words and our actions are more likely to show love than hate. And when we do that, the person is more likely to see our words and actions as the words and actions of Christ. They are more likely to see Christ in us. And that is how we grow the gospel. That is what Jesus is speaking of. Be unified 
in our actions and words in showing Christ, even when we disagree. The Apostle Paul had the love of Christ in his heart following his conversion. Peter, the disciple who becomes the Apostle, had the love of Christ in his heart. They disagreed on matters of the church. And yet their disagreement never led to condemning the other person or making the other person the enemy. Their differences uplifted each other and they were family. Unity is not about having to have everyone around you agree with you and pushing everyone who doesn't agree with you out. It means understanding each other's differences and seeing their value through them. As we work in the church to be unified and hopefully have that embraced in our community and then going further, it is important to have a goal to move forward. Because when we're unified, if you look at this passage in John 17, the unity was always for a purpose, to spread the love of Christ to those who needed to hear it. And I want you to think about the sport of crew, rowing. And you have a, a team, and it may be two, maybe four, maybe more, but these are men and women who are on a team rowing together. And they are synchronized perfectly. They have a common goal, to get as fast as they can as to that finish line to win. There's one person calling, leading, helping to keep the motion and rhythm going, and everyone else is perfectly rowing. One, two, three, four. What's interesting is you'll see a crew rowing and somebody's oar will break. That person is no longer contributing to the goal of the team. What do they do? Do they become a spectator watching everyone else row? No. You will see them jump out of the boat. Why? Because they are no longer contributing and now their weight is slowing everyone down. It is better for them to be out of the boat, to lighten it, so that the rest of the team can keep going. In the church, our oar sometimes breaks and we sit. In our community, we sometimes lose the vision, the goal of where we're heading, and we sit. When we do so, we actually slow things down. It's important not to jump out of the boat and be done, but to replace that oar. In real life, we can replace it to keep moving forward. Sandwich, you have been amazing for nine months in one of the hardest storms that we have ever faced in our church and in our lives and in our community. And we have kept pushing forward farther and faster than ever thought possible. What is the goal of the United Church of Sandwich? It is to share the love of Christ. And for our church, we tie that with food a lot. And we have lived up to that. But that we are going to feed people body, mind, and spirit. You have kept your eye on the goal and you have kept that or moving. And so, Wherever we go in a church, or whatever we do, we are family, and we are unified. Not because we all agree and disagree. You have a pastor who is a Packer fan. I know that's not easy for many of you. On any given Sunday, we are rooting against each other's teams. But we are family, not because we're all fans of the same football team, but because even in our differences, we love each other. And that's the attitude 
we take to the town. And when we vote, and when we go through these elections, that's the attitude we live in our nation. John Wesley, 1774, said this, I met with those of our society who had votes in the ensuring election, and I advised them. And so from all, 250 years ago, John Wesley advises you today. He says to you, vote without fee or reward for the person that you judge most worthy. He says, to speak no evil of the person that you are voting against. And he says, and this is the most important, I believe, to take care your spirit that is not sharpened against those who have voted for the other side. Unity in today's age is accepting our differences and loving each other, even in our dysfunction, because Christ loves us. And if we can do so, we join the disciples of John 17 in being empowered by the Spirit that those who see us will see God through Christ. Amen.